years. The Philippine Institute for Development Studies, or PIDS, has been the country's foremost socioeconomic think tank. It conducts rigorous and objective policy research and analyses that help the government in crafting relevant policies, plans, and programs in support of the country's long-term vision and development goals. PIDS pursues its mandate through three basic programs research, dissemination, and outreach. Through its research program, PIDS identifies and prioritizes studies, develops proposals, and conducts research on priority areas. The results of these studies are then disseminated through different platforms, publications, online resources, PIDS Corner, Seminars, and the Development Policy Research Month or DPRM held every September. To shed light on key policy issues, the advice and expertise of the Institute's research fellows are also sought by policymakers, government agencies, private sector, and civil society. Since 1977, PIDS has completed numerous policy studies on a wide range of development topics. This brand of service has then translated to policies and programs that have improved the lives of every Filipino. Philippine Institute for Development Studies, Service Through Policy Research. In need of references for your research? Do you want a search engine that is easy to navigate? And do you want it free? If you are a student, researcher, or teacher looking for socioeconomic references and materials, then SERPI is for you. To access SERPI, just visit the PIDS website at www.pids.gov.ph and click the SERPI widget or type serp-p.pids.gov.ph. SERP is an online database of socioeconomic studies and materials produced by the Philippine Institute for Development Studies and other academic and research institutions. SERP has a wide variety of socioeconomic materials such as journal articles, books, working papers, policy notes, research papers, and newsletters. SERPI has 52 partner institutions that contribute publications to the database. SERPI has a wide coverage of materials encompassing 20 research themes. You can search by keyword or author, by publication type, by research theme, or year published. SERPI has more than 7,000 materials with full text that you can download for free. Enjoy searching! Visit SERPI now and follow us on Facebook. You may also send a message for inquiries. Oo, dapat nilang pag-aralan yung batas at polisiya para mas makita nila yung epekto at resulta nito. <clears throat> pag nanguli tayo, wala tayo may sasagot. Kaya dapat pag-aralan din natin. Oo, dapat nilang pag-aralan ng mga batas at polisiya para malaman nila kung epektibo ba ito sa karamihan o magiging problema lang. Kung walang basihan ng isang batas, basta na lamang ipatutupad at walang pulso na kinukuha sa mga mamamayan, eh, mahirap. Mahalagang isailalim sa masusing pagsusuri ang mga polisiya at programa ng pamahalaan bago pa man ito ipatupad. Dapat ring ipagpatuloy ang pagsubaybay o pagmonitor sa mga ito habang ipinapatupad hanggang sa matapos ang kanilang implementasyon. Dito pumapasok ang tungkuli na ginagampanan ng Philippine Institute for Development Studies 
ang PIDS, ang siyang sangay ng pamahalaan na naatasang gumawa ng pag-aaral at pananaliksik at magbigay ng rekomendasyon sa mga mambabatas at iba't ibang sangay ng gobyerno tungkol sa mga programa at pulisiya sa pamahalaan upang masigurong matugunan nito ang socioeconomic needs ng ating bansa. Pag pinag-aralan, mas effective! Hi everyone, uh, good afternoon. I'm Sheila CR. We will start at two o'clock and while waiting, uh, please take uh, time to read the uh, house rules that are flashed on the screen. So I will see you at two o'clock. Thank you.
Hello. Yeah. Hi everyone, welcome to the PIDS uh, webinar series. May I have your attention and our house rules. So for all attendees, your microphone is muted upon entry and this is to prevent background noise, but this doesn't mean that you cannot um, participate in the discussion. So to, to join the open forum, just use the chat box, which is located at the lower part of your screen. So just type your name and your um, affiliation as well as your question and send it to all panelists. I repeat to all panelists and not to a particular person. And I will read your question during the open forum. And since we have limited time, please you make your questions uh, concise. And for our, our viewers on Facebook, you are also welcome to participate in the discussion. Just uh, type your question in the comment section and I will read up to two questions during the open forum. Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, I am Sheila CR and I will be moderating uh, this webinar. And uh, we are back to our weekly webinar series where we discuss development issues based on data and evidence. So friends, in today's webinar, we are featuring a PIDS study that investigated the impacts of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic on the poverty level in the Philippines. So we know that this crisis pushed many people into poverty and this study provides some estimates based on simulations <coughs> of the number of affected individuals. This uh, study likewise uh, gives uh, some recommendations on uh, policy and program uh, interventions to lessen the, uh, the pandemic's uh, negative impacts on the poor and the marginalized. It also outlines some policy and data issues in the current poverty measurement mm -hmm. system in the country and ways to address these. At this point, may I call on the Vice President of PIDS, Dr. Marife Ballesteros, to formally open our event. Thank. Thanks, Sheila. Uh, we are joined this afternoon by officials from different sectors of society. Allow me first to go through the list. Uh, Mayor Nestor Alvarez from Munoz City. Our Undersecretary Laura Pasqua of DBM. Undersecretary Juan Antonio Perez III of Capcom. Assistant Secretary Alex Avila of Dole. Neda Director uh, M. Richard Ballesteros, Executive Director Josie Almeda of PSRTI, uh, Secretary Noel Felonco of the National Anti Poverty Commission, Director Reggie Tamania of the Senate of the Philippines, Director General uh, Roby Miral of the House of Representatives, SSS Vice President Eleanor Y. Simpo. From the private sector, we have the Vice President of CPRM Consultants, Manjit Sohal, the Deputy Executive Director, Jaime Jimenez of the Strat Base Institute, CEPI President, Dan Lachica, Manila Water Philippine Ventures President, Virgilio Rivera Jr., and uh, Dr. Mahar Mangahas from SWS. From the academe, we have President Laura Del Rosario of the Miriam College, and from uh, the international organizations, CSOs and NGOs, um, we have Deputy, UNDP Deputy Resident Representative Enrico Gavelia, Masaganang Sakahan Director Daniel Agustin, Director Presinita Sanchez, CPDC of CPDC, Vice Consul Luis Gustavo Sosa of the Embassy of Brazil in Manila, Assistant to the Ambassador Mavis Chongson of the Embassy of Mexico, Ibon Foundation Executive Director Sunny Africa, CNCI Executive Director Anya Mendoza. So let me also greet our colleagues from the government, academe, civil society, and the private sector, and to those who are watching us uh, through the PIDS Facebook page, a pleasant good afternoon to all and welcome to our weekly public uh, webinar. The COVID-19 pandemic has affected the lives of all of people all over the world. And uh, with the lockdowns and the social distancing measures, 
which has been in effect since March uh, in many countries. Most offices, businesses, and schools, and a lot more establishments were forced to operate in limited capacities, if not close. So this has resulted in a slowdown of economic activities that has since affected the employment and livelihoods of people uh, around the world. And the Philippines is not an exception. In May this year, the Philippine Statistics Authority reported that the country's gross domestic product dropped by 16.5% in the second quarter of 2020. This is the lowest recorded quarterly growth starting 1981 series. As the con country continues to grapple with the pandemic, other forecasts have also been uh, coming up. One from the Asian Development Bank, also with the World Bank, and they suggested that the economy would further contract before it would get better. A PIDS study released earlier this year had also projected that pandemic may cost the Philippine economy between 276 billion to 22.5 trillion with manufacturing, wholesale and retail, transport, storage, and communication as the most hit sectors. These projections and figures have raised concerns that the country's recent gains in improving the living conditions of Filipinos would be negatively affected. For instance, the PSA released in 2019 its official estimate of poverty, which is based on the 2018 FIES, which is before the pandemic. And it was reported then that their poverty incidence in the Philippines was at 16.7 percent. This is in 2018, which is about 7 percent lower than the 2015 estimates of 23.5 percent for Filipinos. So this translates to 17.6 million Filipinos who live below the poverty threshold in 2018. Similarly, the P PSA reported that the subsistence poverty rate has also gone down from 9.1% in 2015 to 5.2% .2 in 2018. According to NEDA Secretary Carl Chua, in his opening remarks during the sixth annual public policy conference, which uh, PIDS had organized, the country's poverty incidence may temporarily climb to 17.5% due to the disruption in the economic activities. But he remains optimistic that the goal of bringing down poverty to 14% by 2022 is still doable. So we will learn more about these topics in, the afternoon's web, in this afternoon's webinar. This will feature a PIDS study that simulated the likely effects of contractions in per capita income on poverty and the entire income distribution amid the pandemic. And we will be using data, the simulation will be using data from 2018 FIS. Later on, we will know more about the different scenarios that the study examined and how each would affect Filipinos, particularly those in the low and middle income classes. We will also hear some interventions and strategies of the government to mitigate the impacts of the pandemic, as well as some recommendations on how to improve data collection and measurement of poverty in the country. At this point, I would also like to thank Assistant Secretary Jocelyn Diwane of the Department of Social Welfare and Development, as well as Deputy Executive Director, Mr. Elvin Uy of the Philippine Business for Social Progress, who will join us this afternoon as discussants. They will be sharing their insights uh, regarding this issue uh, with us. So I look forward to hearing your inputs during, this open for during the open forum and thank you and have a good day. Thank you, Peng. So let us now proceed to the presentation titled Poverty, Middle Class and Income Distribution Amid COVID-19, authored by Jose Ramon Albert, Michael Ralph Abrigo of Francis Markham and Shana Flor Vismanos. And to present the paper is Dr. Jose Ramon Albert, who is a senior research fellow at PIDS. He was the Secretary General of the defunct National Statistical Coordination Board, who was uh, 
which was consolidated with other statistics offices into the Philippine Statistics Authority, or PSA. He is also a member of various uh, bodies and expert groups on statistics and related matters, including the United Nations Global Pulse Data Privacy Advisory Group, and the Philippine Commission on Higher Education's Technical Committee on Statistics. He was also part of the Secretariat on, of an Expert Committee that, ex, that evaluated the Philippine Statistical System in 2007. He finished BS Applied Math Summa Cum Laude from De La Salle University, MS in Statistics, and a PhD in Statistics from the um, from the State University of New York at Stony Brook. His main research interests are education, social protection, poverty, big data, data mining, and information and communications technology. Here now is Dr. Jose Ramon Albert, or uh, Dr. Toots Albert, for his presentation. Toots? Uh, thanks, Sheila. Uh, since April, many have been concerned that the government ayuda should not be limited to the poor. So there has been a lot of attention to what exactly we mean by the middle class, a definition of which we propose in several PIDS studies in the past. We are all well aware that this pandemic has changed the Philippines and the world. And even when this is all over, uh, we will not be able to return to our old normal ways, much of which have led to the level of preparedness we have in handling a crisis like this. Today, as was mentioned by Sheila, I will be presenting on behalf of Mike Abrigo, Francis Kimba, and Jana Vismanas, an unprogrammed and unfunded study we did this year, examining the micro data made available to us last April by the Philippine Statistics Authority on the 2018 Family Income Expenditure Survey, or FIES, in response to a request by um, from Acting Secretary of Economic Planning, Carl Chua, for studies pertaining to the pandemic. To structure this talk, after a brief introduction about the context of the study and the study objectives, we will discuss briefly the economic impact of the pandemic as well as the official poverty measurement system. We will proceed our main results examining the 2018 FIES that describes poverty in the middle class and the entire distrib income distribution and simulating the impact of the pandemic based on this data source. Finally, we give a summary and, and discuss some policy implications. Last December, as was mentioned by uh, Vice President uh, Peng Balesteros earlier, the PSA released poverty statistics based on the 2018 FIES. These figures were actually slightly revised last June. The PSA points out that the proportion of Filipinos in poverty with incomes less than the official poverty lines of about 10,700 pesos monthly for a family of five, reduced from 23.5% in 2015 to 16.7% in, in 2018. Further, subsistence poverty, which represents the proportion in extreme poverty, whose incomes are not even sufficient to meet food needs, reduced from 9.1% in 2018 to 5.2% in 2018. However, unfortunately, these are old data already because now what has happened to, to Filipinos amidst the, the crisis? So the improved level of well, uh, welfare um, certainly expanded the middle class in the country, but we don't know to what extent unless we actually examine the FIES microdata. And uh, as I already mentioned, in the wake of COVID, there's concern that maybe the trajectory in reducing poverty has changed and whatever improvements in living standards that we have had over the years may have been wiped out. Of course, there might be some data like uh, we have Mahar Mangas here, uh, they regularly uh, um, monitor hunger and other things. Uh, so they do have data, but they're proxies of, of the information, the official poverty estimates. Our study provides uh, some simulation exercises, as I was, as I was already mentioned. The COVID-19 pandemic has threatened the growth momentum of the economy. To reduce the infections, the government responded with a hammer. Tough containment measures through social distancing guidelines and an enhanced community quarantine, ECQ, that uh, restricts movements of people and effectively reduced business operations to only the essentials. 
The containment measures have had tremendous effects on the economy, resulting in the losses of incomes, jobs and investments, and disruptions in the domestic value chains. Such lockdowns have also been used in other countries with consequences to our overseas remittances. What we aim to do in this study is essentially, as I already mentioned earlier, examine what was made available to us, microdata, from 20, uh, on the, the 2018 FIES. This so, was PSA last April that can help us describe not only poverty, but the middle class and the entire income distribution as of 2018, as well as look into simulating the possible effects of COVID-19 on welfare, accounting for some scenarios on reduction of incomes, but also incorporating the effects of government cash support or income subsidies. Finally, we would like to recommend policy interventions and strategies, particularly on social protection, for addressing the likely increases in poverty and inequality resulting from this pandemic. The pandemic has turned the world upside down. Everything has been impacted. How we live and interact with each other, how we work and communicate, and how we move around and travel. The direct economic impacts of the coronavirus have been felt not only to reduce labor, but also to reduce economic activities resulting from travel restrictions, the ECQ, closure of schools, and other gathering places that were meant to manage the spread of the virus. The economy, however, is taking a big hit. ADB, IMF, and World Bank revised their GDP pro growth projections for the Philippine economy initially to modest growth and now more recently to deceleration. All these forecasts are way below the 5.9% growth of the Philippines in 2019, as well as the initial government growth targets of 6.5% to 7.5% prior to the onset of the virus. Outlook now are on account of a shrinking external demand, declines in transportation and tourism revenues, and reductions in remittances. As was mentioned by Peng earlier, Mark Brigo and several researchers in a study released by PIDS a few months ago have even pointed out that economic losses could be substantial. The government has also slashed its GDP growth projections and is now expecting the economy to contract um, by between 2% and 3.5%, although just last Monday, uh, the BSP governor has suggested that the BSP is even forecasting that the GDP may be around negative 7% to, to negative 9%. At the beginning of the pandemic, NEDA already conducted many online surveys to get a feel of the actual impact on uh, economic losses from this then six-week Luzon EZQ. Last May 7, as was already mentioned, the PSA released the GDP for the first quarter, suggesting the economy contracted by 0.2% compared to the first quarter of last year. The second quarter performance was even worse than what government expected even, with the performance decelerating by 16.5%. Many analysts expect the third quarter to be better than the second quarter, but we are far out of the hole, especially as the data from Google's COVID-19 co community mobility reports show continuing deep declines in movements of people in March 29 to September 11 compared to the baseline of January 3 to February 6 of 2020. Usage of retail and recreational establishments, for instance, continues to be down by 36%. Workplaces at negative 43% and transit places at negative 61% as of September. Several international organizations, chiefly IFPRI, the UN and World Bank, have made now casting exercises to estimate the impact of COVID on poverty incidents, using international poverty lines, either with computable general equilibrium or CGE models, or assumptions regarding the contraction of per capita household consumption. The CGE models of IFPRI, as well as that of the UN, estimate how supply and demand shocks, output contractions, or changes in trade or production factors into monetary poverty. I will not ever give details on the IFPRI estimation, but I'd like to mention that uh, the researchers at the World Bank, on the other hand, estimate extreme poverty 
to rise from 8.2% in 2019 to 8.6% in 2020. Or in other words, the number of extremely poor people with incomes less than $1.9 to rise from 632 million to 665 million people. However, just this, just today, there are actually a, a slight re revision uh, by, by these researchers. In an email, I asked these World Bank researchers to identify the specific impacts on ASEAN member states. I give this to you, the slides. They have updated their estimates as of today, just this morning. They emailed me all the information suggesting that ASEAN would have about uh, 7 million more poor, the bulk of which would come from Indonesia, contribute nearly about uh, 5 million. Philippines is next, uh, about 1.6 million more poor. If we use instead an international poverty line of 3.2 US dollars, the number of poor people in poverty would even increase in ASEAN by as much as 21 million, and in Philippines in particular, by as much as 4.8 million. Now, in response to the pandemic and the vulnerabilities we face, we already mentioned government adopted a three-pronged strategy, a macro policy strategy involving, first, containing the spread of the virus, second, providing social protection to the poor and vulnerable, and third, increasing demand and economic activity. All these are supported by now a war chest of about of nearly 2 trillion pesos. And theoretically, this stimulus could yield a V-shaped trajectory on growth. But in the real world, the coronavirus could lead to a prolonged and deep recession, having an L-shape, U-shape, or W-shaped growth with sharp economic volatility. Current policies are meant to mitigate demand and externalities and financing constraints, utilizing monetary and fiscal instruments, and social protection to dampen the impact of adverse shocks to livelihood and to the economy. Let us recall that in the Philippines, poverty is viewed as shortfall in the incomes from the official poverty line of people. Further, we can think of income inequality as indicated by gaps uh, in various statistics across various income groups. We should know that poverty is at the heart of the development agenda, and particularly for the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs. We have SDG 1, we want to have ending of poverty in all forms everywhere. We want to leave no one behind. And in the Philippines in particular, we have mainstream poverty reduction in our own Philippine Development Plan, and we dream of a society where no one is poor, a society that is predominantly middle class by 2040, according to Ambition 2040. Now that the pandemic is hitting us, the Philippines, as well as most countries, have already started to reset our development priorities, reallocating resources to deal with the pandemic, given the emerging new normal. There are, however, dangers that such responses to the pandemic could actually be delinked from the Sustainable Development Goals. Now, let me turn your attention to the official poverty measurement system, which by law defines actually poverty, not just in terms of income, but other non-income correlates of poverty. But the income poverty thresholds are supposed to be defined by NEDA, particularly PSA. The official poverty measurement system essentially comprises three steps, making use of income data, sourced from the triennial FIES. Second, setting the poverty lines, which are based on the cost of basic needs approach. And finally, summarizing the poverty data. Visually, we can think of the income distribution as being uh, divided into the extremely poor, whose incomes are below the food threshold, the poor, whose incomes are below the poverty line and the rest of the population. Now, before I discuss the recent statistics, uh, let me point out that a decade ago, the methodology for poverty lines were revised by the then NSCB under guidance of a technical committee of experts. PSA might need to rethink, that's been a decade already, it might need to re-examine the entire official poverty measurement system 
thinking of whether we should continue using income or use expenditures instead. The data quality, right now, it takes four to five hours of interview time to get interviewed in the FIES. Also, regarding poverty lines, there's criticism that they may not be realistic. Uh, further, the, the menus, we use these menus to actually uh, calculate the food poverty line, but in other countries, they use a basket. Right now, the, our official poverty lines are between $1.9 and $3.2 per person per day. 3.2 is actually used by, in lower middle income countries by the World Bank as the poverty line. So it's, much, it's uh, important for PSA to convene soonest a technical committee rather than just have an interagency committee as is currently uh, being adopted. For a family of five, the poverty line in, in 2018 comes down to about 10,700 pesos monthly for a family of five. If you use food alone, the food threshold is about 7,500 pesos. In 2018, three out of 20 families, 20 uh, Filipinos, uh, uh, were considered poor, or that's about 17.7 .7 million. A third of these poor Filipinos were considered extremely poor, 5.6 million. 12% of Filipino families, or about uh, 3 million households, are, were considered poor in 2018. And this, this is a reduction of the uh, poverty rate uh, of about by, by a third uh, in 2015. Uh, the figure was about 17.9%. Essentially, despite the substantial reduction in poverty in 2018, the overall storyline, description of poverty remains the same. Poverty is still concentrated among farmers and rural folk. We note, however, that our specific metrics can give different storylines also, uh, especially across the entire country. BARM has the highest poverty incidence at 61.8%, NCR the lowest at 2.2%, and the, and the areas near NCR tend to have the lowest poverty. But when you start drilling down to provinces, those with over 50% poverty rates would include Lanao del Sur, Basilan, Sulu, as well as Isabela City, while those under 5% poverty rates would be Pampanga, Laguna, Rizal, Union, and Ilocos Norte, as well as NCR. However, if you're identifying the poorest provinces according to the actual number of poor persons, say those people more than a million people in poverty, we would find that Camarines Sur, Leyte, Negros Occidental, Cebu, Lano del Sur uh, would be having highest poverty on account of very high population also in these areas, aside from Mangindanao and Sulu. As pointed out in a previous study with Jana, uh, the scope of poverty assessments and social protection interventions, however, must go beyond profiling poverty and helping the poor. We must look into various segments of the income distribution uh, because we know that there are vulnerabilities to future poverty, not just by the poor. Uh, this is particularly relevant in the way of impact of COVID-19 on incomes of households. The non-poor is a very big portion of society with a lot of inherent heterogeneity. For the purpose of examining inequality among the poor, the non-poor, and in relation to the poor, it can be helpful to consider this income group typology that we developed years ago for seven studies, starting with, I think this was, we started six years ago, uh, that is about, uh, you know, the, the, um, the, classifying households into low, middle, and high income classes, and then further breaking down the low income into the poor and the low income but not poor, uh, while the middle class would comprise lower middle income, middle middle, higher income, higher uh, middle class groups, while the high income groups could be broken down into the high income but not rich and the rich. But using a special so the table on the screen provides these updated thresholds, as well as some idea of how big uh, the uh, all the different portions of income distribution are. About 47.7% uh, are low income, about half, 50.1% are middle income uh, households, and 
1.1% are high income. And of the middle class households, the bulk, about two thirds, are in the lower middle income group, uh, comprising about 7.6 million households. Thus, in all, if the social amelioration program for 8 million households out of 24.4 million estimated households in 2020 was well targeted, it would have provided benefits for all of the low income class and a sizable proportion of the lower middle income group. As of 2018, households, go to the next slide, are predominantly middle class. Three in five urban households are middle class, while only 3% is high income. Among the rural households, only 38.5% are middle class, 60.5% are low income. Further, in urban areas, the proportion of households belonging to low, middle, and high income classes are 35.8%, 61.3%, and 3% respectively. The bulk of the income groups in urban areas are in the lower middle class, 36%, followed closely by the low income but not poor at 33.8%. So thus, merely seven in 10 persons in urban areas are in these two income groups. On the other hand, in rural areas, but not poor, about 43%, and the poor, 24.6% of the dominant income groups, which in combination make up two thirds or 66.9% of the rural population. While family sizes tend to vary across income distribution, though were the low income class not tend to have a large, larger sized family with more children than those from the middle income and high income classes. But also, it has much more variability in family sizes as seen in this graph. Thus, decisions on fertility and reproductive health tend to be associated with income levels. The middle class tends to spend nearly double to 8% on health compared to the low income class of 1.1%. And this is more than a third uh, less than the high income class of 4.5%. Expenditures on education, on transportation, and communication also rise with income. The lower the low income and middle class spend about 2% of total expenditures on alcohol and tobacco, while the high income class spends less than 1%. The results of the 2018 FIES also confirms Engel's law, which states that the share of food expenditures decreases with increasing, um, sorry, seem to have gotten out of my video. Uh, the Engels Law suggests that the share of middle income of food expenditures decreases with increasing income levels. The low income class spends about three fifths, 57% of its total expenditures on food, while Total food spending for the middle and high income classes are fifth and a fifth of total expenditures, respectively. An upcoming paper on the middle class in Asian Studies Review that I wrote with Babette Never of the German Development Institute suggests that we should, however, be concerned about the rising middle classes from the vantage point of sustainable consumption because the middle class and high income classes make use of private vehicles over public transport. And awareness of environmental issues does not always translate to actions on behaviors, for recycling, and other responsible use of electricity. Hi, Toots. Hi. Yes. Toots. Yes. Uh, if we may um, cut your video, stop sure. your video for a while because your connection, internet connection, is faltering. Is it okay? Okay. okay. Sure. Thank you. All right. So among the estimated 24 million households in uh, 2018, three tenths, uh, about 29.7%, uh, had overseas remittances. The remittances averaged 100,000 pesos, slightly more than a quarter of total household income. On the slide, we see that more than half of these households with remittances were either from lower middle income or low income, but not poor. 
In contrast, only 1 in 20 households with remittances were from the poor. Lower middle income families received an average of 80,000 pesos, double the levels of the low, low income but not poor, and four times the average remittances received by poor households. And in the wake of COVID effects on remittances, these households that benefit from household from overseas remittances would get affected from reduced remittances that would likely result from reduced economic activities in the countries of origin of these remittances. Now for our estimates on the impact of COVID on poverty, we essentially follow uh, the work of Sumner et al. by simulating low, medium, and high contractions of 5%, 10%, and 20% on the entire incomes of everyone that will estimate the impact of COVID on overall income poverty in the Philippines. This might be simplistic given the varying income reductions among Filipinos in the wake of the crisis, depending on the nature of work, um, the risk factors associated of household members, and its consequent effects on labor supply. There are also important non-poverty impacts of COVID, for instance, on health, such as immunization coverage, breastfeeding, malnutrition, on education also, both school participation and quality of learning, and other dimensions of poverty. Unfortunately, these are not captured in actual income losses in the FIES. We note also that the government has introduced several social protection programs in response to the pandemic through the Social Amelioration Program, the SAP, the national government, particularly through the um, Department of Social Welfare and Development, has initi initiated cash transfers for two months uh, of five to 8,000 pesos per month for targeted 18 million households, 75% of around 24.4 million households in the country. Further, there was a Small Business Wage Support Program, or SBWS, uh, and the support levels were, were given were very similar to uh, those given to the SAP beneficiaries. So we, uh, however, local, and also we should note that local governments with the support uh, were of DSWD were also giving food aid either universally or to selected households, but the monetary value and distribution schemes, including the frequency of such food assistance varied considerably to be useful for our simulation. We now show you the summary of our estimates of poverty in the country under various scenarios and income contractions, incorporating the effects of income support that was received from the SAP in, uh, and also from the uh, wage subsidies. The proportion of Filipinos in poverty apparently could rise to as much as 2.4 percentage points if incomes overall contracted across the board by 5%, but it could also be as uh, the uh, poverty could rise by as much as 11.2 percentage points if um, incomes contract by 20% for the entire year. But this would, be, this would mean that there would be like uh, conditions even worse than uh, what was observed uh, before uh, from the in the period 2003 to 2012. Had incomes contracted by 10%, poverty incidence could rise by 5.1 percentage points, or in other words, we would have 5.5 million Filipinos falling into poverty. But because of the social amelioration program uh, and also the uh, wage subsidies in, um, given by government, the increases in poverty were managed to an increase of 1.4 percentage points only. So in other words, we should be expecting around 1.5 million more Filipinos in poverty, much less than the 5.5 uh, million that I mentioned under this middle scenario of income contractions of 10%. Now, for the, this middle case scenario that I mentioned, we all regions would be expecting to would be expected to have increased poverty incidence, be called to increase by as much as 3.1 percentage points. Uh, but for a worst case scenario of let's say 20% income, even with the SAP, uh, poverty could uh, increase by over 10 percentage points in six regions: Bicol, Eastern Visayas, 
uh, Sampanga, Caraga, Barm, and Northern Mindanao. Finally, we explore the likely effects of COVID on attaining the 2014 ambition goal of a middle class society. In our previous work, we provided a simulation of how long the low income and not poor and the poor could become middle class uh, if their, their incomes were all growing at their constant growth rate per year. Now there has been a little bit of a uh, uh, reduction uh, because of incomes of, of, from, from, the, from COVID. So we would now be expecting under the median case scenario of 10% income reduction, but supported by effective social protection. Transition time would increase, no? but just by a quarter of a year. In other words, about three months. But the worst case scenario, there could be uh, as much as three years more than the baseline scenario. So in other words, we now know that certainly Ambition 2040 uh, might be affected uh, uh, and how critical this so social protection programs have actually been, not only for the poor, but even for the low income and not poor. To summarize, given the likely drop in incomes and expenditures of households, we expect the Philippines not only to grow at a slower pace, but also to worsen in poverty conditions. While rapid, uh, with rapid uh, changing data landscape, the PSA needs to re-examine its poverty measurement system, study whether it's important to shift from income to consumption expenditure as uh, using its, the welfare indicator, uh, especially since agriculture and uh, informal sectors do not have regular wages. They also need to look at the approach for poverty line setting, perhaps abandon the menus to food bundles, and also communicate better the poverty statistics. Now, among middle class households, two thirds are in the lower middle group, a quarter are middle middle, and a tenth are upper middle. If SAP targeted 18 million households and this targeting was done well, it benefits all lower income class plus a sizable portion of the lower middle income group. Government and all Filipinos should ensure that the poor at, are at the center of policy attention, especially for the pandemic and similar crisis. The poor often do not have the luxury to seek health care, as we advise people to stay at home and wash your hands. We should note that these are luxuries also for some of our countrymen. Simulation results suggest that income contractions in the wake of COVID can increase poverty by 5.5 million more Filipinos. But because of the government's SAP and wage subsidies, this has been mitigated to only an increase of 1.5 million more Filipinos falling into poverty. However, this would push poverty rates possibly to even likely uh, if you have a worst case scenario of uh, figures even worse than the, what we had a decade ago. But overall, this, this puts now the question of this vision of a middle class society by 2040. It's going to be delayed. There is risk that current inequalities amidst COVID will widen. So pandemic or not, of course, social protection should be at the core of government policies and attention. We should also be need trying to make sure that we should be improving access to and cost of technology, especially the use of internet. We need to work progressively towards universal social protection, uh, but focus primarily on the poor and vulnerable, as well as mainstream the SDGs in all our COVID-19 responses. Finally, we live in the hope that we will survive this pandemic. We will endure and we will heal Though we will likely feel faster if we put a lot of attention to investing in people, 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 including providing progressive universal social protection to improve not only the demand side in the economy, but people's trust in the overall social economic climate. Maraming salamat for your for listening. And thank you. Uh, thank you also to for your comprehensive presentation. Friends, uh, before we proceed to the next part of our webinar, let us take a quick break uh, by having a poll. And I hope you have listened intently to Dr. Albert because our question will come from his presentation. And uh, we will give a prize to the three winners 
who will answer this question correctly and we will get all the names. What we will do is we will get all the names of those who answered the question and randomly pick three names. And each of them, each of the winners, will receive a set of PIDS publications and five guaranteed slots to our next two webinars this October. So are you ready? So here is the question. Uh, Gwen, please. Uh, okay. The question is, according to the study, how many Filipinos would fall into poverty if uh, incomes decrease by 10% and if cash transfers and which subsidies from the national government are made available? A, 1.5 million, B, 5.1 million, and C, 7.4 million. So please key in your answer now. Okay. Um, just a gentle reminder that we have uh, we have there uh, the qualifier if cash transfers and which subsidies from the national government are made available. Okay, so we are now closing the po the poll in five, four, three, two, one. Gwen, kindly reveal um, the answers of our participants. 20 seconds, so we need 20 seconds according to Gwen. So I hope you get the right answer. Okay, Gwen, is it tallying now? Tallying? Going, going. Five seconds according to Gwen. Okay, Gwen. Okay. So a total of 231 answered our poll and 64 answered A, 28 answered B, and um, 13 answered C. So the correct answer is A. So friends, congratulations for those to those who answered A. So um, for those who picked A, so you got the correct answer, and we will select, as I've mentioned, we will select three names from those who answered our poll correctly, and I will announce the winners the names of the winners before we close the open forum. Okay, so at this point, I invite you to listen to our discussions as they share their insights on the study's findings and recommendations. And they will also uh, tell us uh, some of uh, their agencies or offices initiatives in response to the pandemic. Our first panelist is the Assistant Secretary for Policy and Plans as well as head of the Policy Development and Planning Bureau of the Department of Social Welfare and Development, or the SWD. And she uh, also worked with the World Vision and uh, the DSWD field office of the Cordill Cordillera Administrative Region and the Ifugao Provincial Social Welfare and Development Office. She's also an indigenous person from the Ifugao province, a sector whose rights she had represented and championed during her stint at the SWD car. She is a bemedaled public servant and has received the Dagan Lambayan Award from the Civil Service Commission and pres president, uh, former President Fidel V. Ramos in 1997, model public servant by Kilos Bayan, GMA7 in 1998, and Ifugao Achievers Award by, by the Provincial uh, uh, Government of Ifugao in 2001, and the best provincial social welfare and development officer by the, uh, given by the DSWD uh, CAR in 2013. Friends, I now give you Assistant Secretary Jocelyn Pugongniwane of the DSWD. Ma'am? Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we, it's a pleasure to be with you again this afternoon. And uh, good afternoon to Dr. Reyes. Uh, and of course, to our presenter, Dr. Toots Albert, uh, one of our uh, friends here at the, especially here in the uh, policy and plans. Uh, we miss you, sir. So uh, it's a, uh, the presentation was really very, uh, really helped us understand more what is happening to the poverty incidents here in our country. So. Allow me to, to give to you our uh, comments on uh, 
they study uh, to everyone. My fellow discussant, of course, Mr. Elvin Ivan Uwe, colleagues from the public and private sectors and all other participants in the webinar, good afternoon. Thank you once again for inviting me in one of your public webinars and providing a venue for us to share our insights on the national issues that are very close to our agency's mandate. As many of you know, the DSWD mission is to formulate, implement, and coordinate policies and programs for and with the people vulnerable and disadvantaged. It envisions all Filipinos free from hunger and poverty. Thus, the study presented by Dr. Albert is very relevant to us and would really help us in developing, calibrating, and strengthening our social protection policies and programs. On the various income contraction scenarios, the PIDS study yielded significant information and insights, even as it recognizes reflectively that it is based on simulation scenarios and simplistic assumptions. The projection in the study indeed present a strong basis for government efforts to provide social protection, not only for the poor, but also for segments which would most likely fall into the poverty given the economic contractions. This is significant, especially for the DSWD, which was mandated to lead the implementation of the social amelioration program. The government targeted 18 million poor and low income families households across all the regions for the first tranche of the social amelioration program, emergency subsidy program. The program yielded positive results based on the joint study of the World Food Program and the SWD conducted from June, August 2020, where the beneficiaries themselves responded that the emergency cash assistance allowed them to buy food and ba basic items. The second tranche of SAP assistance, however, was limited to the areas identified by the IATF and the waitlisted beneficiaries submitted by the different LGUs, totaling to only 14 million targeted families. The projections from PIDS will be very essential as the second tranche implementation is nearly completed. There is a need to recalibrate the social protection programs and strategize for the middle to worst case scenarios on income contractions. A more refined calculation is necessary in navigating through a protracted recovery and in charting the future of the DSWD programs. While the quarantine levels have been eased and economic activities have started, further loss in income among the extreme poor can drastically affect the gain, especially of the Pantawid Pamilyang Filipino program. The various income contraction scenarios presented in the study also present an opportunity to improve the collaboration among the national and local government units, particularly in harnessing context-specific livelihood opportunities. Further, regional estimates assuming various scenarios give valuable description of what local duty bearers have to deal with, especially within the context of the approaching implementation of the full devolution of government programs in accordance to the Supreme Court ruling on the Mandanas case. The availability, timeliness, and credibility of this aggregated regional data are important and can feed into effective resource prioritization and development at the local level. For my last point regarding the projections presented in the study, please allow me to point out one observation. While the study projected very insightful information on the evidence rate and magnitude of poverty among individuals amid COVID-19 in the various scenarios, it would also be helpful to report the magnitude of poor households as most social protection programs target households and families rather than individuals alone. Such information would greatly help determine the target number of households, beneficiaries for succeeding provision of social assistance, perhaps for the SAP3. On measuring poverty, we agree that policy data issues and poverty measurement system, as well as the poverty line setting methodologies need to be addressed to improve key government interventions. 
The study had a substantial discussion in favor of the use of consumption expenditures as an alternative measure of poverty, indicating that it provides a more adequate picture of well-being than the income-based official poverty statistics. If consumption expenditure patterns of different income levels can indicate unmet needs and well-being, especially among the bottom poor and low-income level families, then it could generate relevant information for government policy and program development. We thus recommend that NEDA, PSA, and PIDS collaborate on studying this matter further. We look forward to an interoperable poverty database because improved poverty registry is vital for the DSWD. On other policy implication and ways forward, the study also pointed out the need to determine the impact of the pandemic to specific groups of people determining further the impact of the pandemic on the different vulnerable groups in crucial as well as we as we want to assist all sectors leave no one behind hopefully such analysis will be carried out in the immediate future to highlight the current concerns on hunger prevalence of online sexual exploitation of children drop in school enrollment dire situation of locally stranded individuals and repartees and issues on workers' safety and health. Our current efforts in the DSWD will hopefully feed in the determining the impact of the pandemic to these groups. Thus, some of DSWD's COVID-19 related engagements are worthy to be mentioned. We are doing an assessment of the responsiveness and service delivery of the LGUs and DSWD on violence against women and children amidst community quarantine due to the pandemic. The number of vow or violence against women and children cases have surged over the period of the community quarantine. The study is set to elicit significant information that would feed into key policy and programs recommendations, improved case management system, and enhanced mechanism in responding to vow VAUC admits the pandemic. Further, we will support the strategic planning of the management of returning Filipinos. <clears throat> this is part of the SWD's task as the lead of the interagency task group, Western Mindanao, management of returning Filipinos. The PIDS paper elucidates the next to bar. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse. Sambuanga Peninsula is the second poorest across poverty measurements and discussed the significance of loss of remittances and employment from overseas. <clears throat> Sorry. In the actual situation of the poor in Mindanao, the return of Filipinos from Sabah. Malaysia <coughs> is a situation directly felt through the thousands of Filipinos who were currently ferried back to the island. In line with the study recommendation to strengthen digitalization efforts of the government, I would also like to share that the SWD <coughs> capitalizes on the use of payment system providers or electronic payments. <laughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. Our electronic payment and collection system providers in the implementation of the second tranche of SAP. We therefore support the recommendation to develop government policies that make technology and development more inclusive. <clears throat> Lastly, we do agree that social protection should be at the core of government policies where there is pandemic or not. The Enhanced Social Protection Operational Framework revised in the early 2019 uses a risk management approach in identifying the risk and vulnerability supported by the principles of universality, inclusivity, and having a transformative role. The DSWD, as chair of NEDA Subcommittee on Social Protection, and he... <coughs> Shucks. 
<coughs> oh, the DSWDS Chair of NEDA, Subcommittee on Social Protection and Human Development and Poverty Reduction Cluster, has a vital role in actively advocating the realization of a true universal social protection. As an added recommendation to the study, the social protection floor for the Philippines should be developed to achieve the progressive universal social protection. Given the efforts of the poverty data showing where we are and stimulating where we will be given certain interventions and economic factors, we are compelled to re recognize that bolder steps <clears throat> Strength and government ex exertions are key and must be done. Rest assured that the, the SWD will be at the forefront in serving the poor, vulnerable, and disadvantaged. To you, congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations to Dr. Albert and the Holes Research Team. Apologies for. Thank you very much, um, Asik Josi, and uh, take care. We appreciate your um, presentation, uh, especially your report on the initiatives of the DSWD to respond to the pandemic. Okay, so let us now um, hear the um, response, the comments of our next discussant. And he can provide the perspective of civil society and the business sector, as well as of government, as he also used to work um, with the gov with government. And the um, currently he is the deputy executive director of the Philippine Business for Social Progress or PBSP, the country's large largest uh, business led NGO at the forefront of strategic corporate citizenship and business sector leadership for sustainable development and poverty reduction. He is um, a former assistant secretary and K-12 uh, Program Coordinator of the Department of Education and also did uh, product management, business development, strategic management, and sustainability in the local telecommunications and steel industries. He has a, ma he has a master's in public policy and management from the Carnegie Mellon University in Australia as an Australian, as an Australia Award Scholar and an and an electronics and communications engineering degree, magna cum laude, from the De La Salle University. Friends, here is Deputy Director, Deputy Executive Director Elvin Uy of the Philippine Business for Social Progress. Thank you, Sheila. Good afternoon, everyone. Magandang hapon. Thank you to PIDS for organizing this webinar. Thank you to Dr. Toots Albert and the entire research team for doing this, I, as I understand, on a pro bono basis responding to the challenge of Secretary, Acting Secretary uh, Carl Chua about having studies and better data to respond to the pandemic and the economic challenges. Um, I welcome as well my fellow discussant, Asik Joselin, and I hope, ma'am, you, you feel better soon. Uh, baka lang po kayo, ma'am. Now, before I give my, my reaction and discussion, let me just briefly introduce who we are as Philippine Business for Social Progress. It is a mouthful. PBSP is a 49-year-old non-government organization. We are a business-led uh, NGO, and we operate in the nexus of businesses or corporate, corporate citizenship, international development, and poverty reduction. So we link businesses, both local companies and multinationals operating in the Philippines, with communities, individuals, and sectors who would benefit from the resources, expertise, and support of the private sector. For much of our 49-year history, we have also been a vehicle for international development assistance to the Philippines. Um, maybe uh, tangent or related to, to the pandemic, our biggest program of the past decade has been a grant from the Global Fund to fight AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria. So PBSP, our organization, serves as the principal recipient for the tuberculosis grant in the Philippines. And we have worked closely with the Department of Health and local government units in terms of the National Tuberculosis Control Program, or NTP, of our country. And, and just to briefly share what we have been doing on that front, on one, on one half, we are trying to ensure that we contribute to the public health 
response to the pandemic. So that means everything from um, helping with the country's PCR testing capacity to equipping our medical frontliners and professionals with the needed PPE to even providing hazard support or hazard pay to our project personnel who are deployed in health facilities and testing centers. The other half of what we do for the Global Fund on tuberculosis is also to COVID-proof the tuberculosis program of the country. Um, we understand that the public health sector and even the private health sector is our focus on, on responding to COVID-19. And that might compromise or jeopardize some of the other key diseases that we are trying to, to manage and confront the last few years. And we have seen, unfortunately, adverse uh, impact to other disease programs of government and of the private sector, but we try to do our best in mitigating these adverse impacts. Um, we also work a lot with private sector, both our member companies and other for-profit corporations in making sure that we contribute to key social development outcomes and, and teams. So teams on health, on education, on environment and disaster resilience, and livelihood and enterprise development. Now, considering the study made by Dr. Dr. Toots and, and his team, uh, let me just say that we fully agree with the need for revisiting the way our country and the government measures poverty. I draw in particular the experience of PBSP in the Zero Extreme Poverty Philippines 2030 movement, or ZEP, Z-E-P. So ZEP was uh, constituted and organized by Philippine and Philippine-based uh, non-government organizations and civil society groups back in 2015. This was to complement and amplify the commitment of government with the sustainable development goals, uh, particularly with eliminating or fighting extreme poverty by 2030. And from, from the time that we started that work back in 2015 up to now, we have since used or we have shifted to the use of expenditure or consumption-based measures of poverty. So we use what, what we call the Poverty Probability Index, PPI, adapted to the Philippines by the Innovations for Poverty Action, or IPA. And that's how uh, the ZEP as a movement and the individual member organizations or networks have done to or have used to profile the communities and beneficiaries uh, that we work with. That, that allows us to measure whether a particular household or individual belong to the extremely poor sector or not. Um, I think given the, the challenges, the constraints that we have faced the last seven, eight months with the ongoing pandemic and then the developing or the ongoing economic slowdown, it's high time for, for government to reconvene not just itself, but also to organize the technical committee of experts to see how we can better measure poverty and its impact, particularly to sectors which are which have already been marginalized even prior to the pandemic, but are more so uh, severely affected by the current crises. We do know from previous uh, studies and experiences in both pandemics and economic recessions and depressions that it is the poor and the other marginalized sector who are disproportionately affected, while maybe the middle and upper middle class and the high income groups can eventually rebound if they are not severely affected. Those in the lower rungs of our economy or society uh, do not have these luxuries. The second thing I'd like to point out is um, we also invite and we also open our arms to deeper collaboration with the various government agencies and entities, both at the national and local levels. While we want to have better data to inform policy making, to inform priorities and direction setting, I think where it becomes meaningful for these marginalized communities is when government animates and activates a very robust and a very active, I would say, civil society sector. Uh, so we pride ourselves, our country, we pride ourselves as having one of the most vibrant 
uh, civil society and non-government sector, um, we there are challenges to working with government at different levels, from data collection to the robustness of program implementation to having a a sound uh, framework for MNE and even having just open dialogue about how best we can move forward. I think one thing that the pandemic has 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 shown to all of us, uh, be it from the private or public sectors, is the need for deeper and more honest collaboration. We have to identify where the pro problems are most pronounced. We have to be quick to identify potential solutions. If those solutions don't work, that's okay. We iterate and we do the next best solution. Um, we don't have to get everything right at the first time, but we have to be able to quickly fail and move to the next solution, I should say. And my third main point is, is, is on having sustained solutions. Uh, we welcome the support from the SWB, from government, from Bayanihan 1, even the Bayanihan 2 that was just signed by the president a few weeks ago. Those support will probably tide us over for the next few weeks, next few months, but the, the end of the tunnel is not clearly in sight yet. Uh, we hope it arrives sooner rather than later. But if the public health crisis and the economic challenges continue until much of 2021, there has to be more sustained solutions, both from the public and private sector, to, to work on these things, on areas such as public health, on mobility, even on what I would say, not just learning continuity um, uh, that, that focuses on basic or higher education, but having a more holistic human resource development strategy that also looks at our displaced workers, uh, workers who might be un underemployed, or workers who might need to be reskilled or upskilled to be able to cope and to try to adjust to the new realities of the the various industries and various workplaces. Um, I think that's that's at least my our main reaction to the to the study done by by Dr. Albert and his team and the inputs from from the SWD. On our part as PBSP and as members of uh, civil society and non-government sector here in, in the country, we continue to operate and to push forward despite all the difficulties and challenges. A lot of you will know that um, there is significant donor fatigue as well. Uh, donor enthusiasm and wallets were quite open to us maybe for the first eight to 12 weeks of the, of the crisis. Um, that has since also been been dwindled. We're hoping maybe for a second win with the holiday season this quarter, but uh, we cannot uh, solely rely on on the generosity of of strangers and our fellow Filipinos and even international donors. I think the solutions will really have to come from from each one of us and businesses, NGOs, and civil society uh, together with government will continue to to navigate um, these challenges and hopefully there will be better days. Let me reiterate and let me support uh, Dr. Toot's call for people, people, people. Yes, I think that is the kind of PPP we all need and we all require to respond to this and to rebound from this pandemic. And we are all hoping for better days in 2021. Thank you and good afternoon. Thank you very much, Elvin. So at this point, uh, friends, I'd like to invite you to reflect on um, the um, insights provided by our discussions, as well as the findings and recommendations from uh, the study of uh, Dr. Albert. And if you have questions, feel free to use our chat box. And also for our uh, uh, Facebook viewers, as I've mentioned earlier, you are welcome to participate in the discussion please uh, use the uh, Facebook, the, the comment section of Facebook, and I will read up to two questions in our Q&A. Okay, so we are now ready to entertain um, questions from our participants. And as an aside from Dr. Dr. Albert Asset Joyce and um, Deputy Executive Director Uy of the PBSP, uh, Dr. Francis Kimba, co-author of Dr. Albert in, uh, in this study, will also uh, be joining us in the Q&A. 
Okay, so, um, okay, uh, we have two questions so far from our um, Facebook viewers. So, uh, Toots, if I may direct this question to you. Sure, Sheila. Okay, and this one is from um, um, Otto de Vries, a research officer from the EILER. So he said in July 2019, the ILO, ILO published its first global report on labor income share and distribution using a new model with a, with a micro adjusted data set. It shows that the labor income share in the Philippines between 2005 and 2017 decreased with 7.4% from 34% to 26.6%, indicating a rising income inequality. Contrary to the former uh, formerly used model, this new advanced model of the ILO reflects more the reality of labor in the Philippines as despite strong GDP growth, real wages remain flat. Moreover, abundant contractualization and a huge informal economy depress further the labor income share in the Philippines. So he's asking your comment on those findings of the ILO in this global report. Well, I haven't read that report yet, quite honestly, but I I welcome that 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 uh, this this whole idea that there there needs to be really a, an examination of of the the changing uh, labor dynamics. Uh, mm -hmm. This even prior to to COVID, we already knew that there would be massive changes in the labor market, partly because of the fourth industrial revolution, yes. mm -hmm. and and we know that now that we are all forced to. Uh, digitalize much more because well, many of us are, are staying at home. Even businesses are uh, working from home. Has has, has changed. Uh, has been part of the linga for, uh, franca. No, uh, so that also means that um, businesses will probably start recognizing that they don't need to have as much people in the office. And 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 if they don't need, so they will need to reduce their the, the levels of employment. That that puts many more people at risk and so the question is how do you how do you change uh how do you up uh, reskill people to make sure that uh, they should they should they lose one job they can easily shift to another job i mean i've i've had a lot of friends who for instance in the in in uh, in uh, in in the celebrity world who who have been very severely affected uh uh with all the reduced economic activity and and they and some of them you know uh they're just trying to hang on so the question is uh again what what kind of opportunities do we, do we give to people who are who are really going to be affected not just by the pandemic but by the new normal and these are things that need to be re-examined very carefully uh the you know the i know the department of labor and employment has always had difficulty coming up with specific strategies partly because you know, labor and employment. Uh, you know, I mean, are, are two two separate matters. But then, uh, but then uh, it's 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 as though people always expect when you say labor and employment, uh, government will give them jobs. No? <laughs> but we, which need not necessarily be the case. So there will be a need for for human capital to be really improved considerably. And this is where education will be extremely important. And by education, we don't I don't necessarily mean just formal education, but a lot of. Uh, uh, investments in, in human capital. Thank you, Toots. For our next question, I'd like to call on uh, Dr. Uh, Mahar Mangahas. Uh, I saw that he has a question in our chat box, but uh, he may want to ask um, the question himself. Sir, we have unmuted your mic, Dr. Mangahas. I think so. Yes, sir. Go ahead my, with your my, question. My question is to ask when will be the next official measure of poverty, because the, uh, the schedule, as I know, is 2021 as a reference date. Is there a new reference date or is it still 2021? Yeah, yeah, Mahar, I, I don't speak for the PSA anymore, as you know, <laughs> but as far as I, I know, understand, you know. Yeah, but as far as I understand, the, the, there's, no, there's no difference in the, because FIES has always been triennial. Uh, there was a time that they developed estimates of of poverty on the first semester using the APs, but I was one of the most critical of of that because the 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 instruments are not quite the same, and therefore there's a comparability issue. 
So the unless they 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 actually conduct FIS every every two years, but or even or annually, which I don't think because it's also expensive. So I my sense is that it will still be 2021. But even before that, they will need mm. to examine the poverty lines uh, and 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 all the specific uh, protocols regarding poverty measurement. Yeah, you know, I'm just trying to find out if there's any any uh, move to try to speed it up because it's COVID yeah. time now. Apparently, yeah. voila. Yeah, actually, that's that's my concern. Even right now with the with this FIES, when we uh, when we asked the 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 2018 FIES data, they gave it to us last April after we requested for it, and we kept asking because right now it's really just the FIES and. Some questions yeah. in FIS were not even there. The labor force survey, which we could, which we could merge, uh, they haven't given us that part too. So if we oh, had, hello. if we had <laughs> actually uh, much more, much more data from 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 them from the PSA, and can you imagine that that's 2018 and now it's 2020 and still, <laughs> you know, this is you, still you, to some extent old news. And like, uh, you're like, saying uh, that the the government yeah, is not even sharing. Among itself, it, well, it's, not that, also. it's not that uh, it's not that they're not sharing because they have protocols about when to release the labor force survey. I think it yeah. uh, it's it's uh, six months. The micro data is always available six months after the reference period, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the January okay. round, and then they, they had problems. I think because they were they they much as they wanted to. I think they they this was this is now one hundred sixty thousand households. That they sampled, so this is quite big. So they were they were doing uh, even. Uh, um, I think they had problems with with the issues of GPS coordinates or something like that. So which and because this was their first time doing it, that's why they probably had uh, more difficulty in actually giving us all the data that we wanted. But they said they promise it's coming soon. So if it's coming before the end of the year, then maybe I might. Get, need to get uh, a at least uh, <laughs> some extra information published, uh, whether it's in the revision of this paper or perhaps uh, an extra policy note that I'll be giving to Sheila. Okay. Thank so, you very so much, Dr. The... Mahas. No, sige. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, perhaps uh, someone from uh, PSA uh, who is attending this webinar can give us uh, details, can give us some updates. And uh, we welcome you to, uh, to, to join the discussion. Just let us know and we will um, uh, give you the floor. Okay, so let us now uh, go to the other questions. Uh, this one is from Eduardo Jimmy Kilang. And Toots, um, okay, we can, we can uh, get the uh, response here of uh, ASEC uh, Josie. Ma'am, um, according to Eduardo, the SEP program is only about 8,000 per family, if I am right. Uh, well, it's uh, five to 8,000. Can you further explain why this has reduced the poverty from about 5 million people to only 1.5 million and how many millions the SEP has reached? Uh, to its, perhaps you can, you can uh, answer this uh, based on your, um, because this, this was part of your simulation. Yeah, uh, you see, the the thing is, of course, the the SAP funds were I, we are we were assuming it was correctly given, you know, but you, you have to remember that uh, when you think of the poor, the poor also are, are are at various parts of the income distribution. So for for some, even a slight uh, slight income, even if their 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 the incomes reduce, you give them eight thousand times two, uh, that will help a lot, and that can. For some, that they they may actually cross the poverty line. So for some, they will still be poor, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the it, the the impact will be very different depending on how much they actually received and where what region they were in, etc. And and uh, to some extent, uh, the other thing too was that the que the question here is how many are, are the people near the poverty line, you know? So that and even the poverty line itself, it's I I gave you in the presentation and in the paper an average. Uh, in the in the national figures, but you usually poverty lines actually depend on what region you are, what province you are located. Uh, it, it it has a cost of living differentials, and uh, so in a way, it's it's not quite the ten thousand. The ten thousand something is just uh, for a family of five. So it's uh, so that's why it's a bit complicated. But but to 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 that extent, that's why 
there was uh you know the the impacts will be different okay thank you for that uh toots uh another question which is also related to the sap and may i ask uh ask me wanted to uh, answer this because it's not just the sap but other dsw programs and this one is from jennifer palaganas aside from sap do we have programs uh i think he's, she's referring to long-term programs that would instead teach the people to fish rather than relying more from the social amelioration funds are there strategies or plans in place for this um as a josie yeah uh thank you yes uh the the DSWD has uh, other regular programs, and but for the SAP one, we have actually the LAG, which is the uh, Livelihood Assistance Grant. And for the regular program, this is the uh, SLP, uh, wherein we provide uh, cash assistance, which is uh, actually for capital seed assistance to our people, so that they will own, they will not have to be just uh, be giving fish, but they will learn how to fish by uh, entering into livelihood uh, activities and entrepreneurial skills would be necessary. So it is uh, usually in conjunction with uh, TESDA uh, and other uh, agencies who could be able to help them gain skills so that uh, they could be able to, uh, after the uh, relief that would be given to them, they could already go back to their normal life. Uh, even in the needs of this pandemic. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am. Okay, we have a, uh, another question, um, and this time it's about uh, data collection uh, from Director Novel Bangsal of the CPBRD. Um, this, uh, this is about the CBM as, CBMS law. How will this impact the poverty collection data and what will happen to the FIES as well as the instruments to be used to measure uh, poverty and as a follow-up he asks how regular will the collection of the poverty data as well and will be will it be every three years like the FIES and how about the cost we had a, uh, a webinar on the CBMS uh, when was this July 30 I think but um, Toots uh, would you have any Thoughts yeah. on this? Questions yeah. from Novell? Yeah, of course, right now the PSA has been mandated to sort of oversee the CBMS. Uh, but CBMS is really a, uh, a a tool that's that's initiated by the local governments. Uh, and uh, and there, so in a way, the data collection streams are a bit different. FIES is, is done by, by, by regularly every three years by the Philippine Statistics Authority. But it, but the the thing is, FIES is is uh, is done triennially, and then as I said, it's just a sample of households. Right now, they're they've increased the the sample households from regularly before it was some forty to fifty thousand households. Now it's one hundred sixty thousand households that they have interviewed last for the twenty eighteen. Uh, uh, on the other hand, CBMS once it is implemented in a in a particular local government, uh, it's it's something like a census. No, uh, they they do it for all. It's not a sample. So in a way, the the instruments may be a bit different. So so that's why. Uh, now helping in in the in crafting the, the, the specific protocols, they have to be very careful because PSA has its census, and then they now we have CBMS, and then now we, they have also regular surveys. And you know, it's at some point, uh, people will get tired of answering forms. You know? <laughs> so you have to be extra careful that uh, you don't uh, you don't give fatigue also to, to people because uh, at the end of the day, people, uh, will always need to sort of you don't need you don't need we want to overburden them. Okay, um, thank you, Toots. We have a, another question here, and this time it's on uh, the numbers of uh, out of school children. And uh, if you may, if I may address this question to you, because you had a um, um, a research in the past on uh, out-of-school children. So Camille Regina Ma Maala 
Maala asked, um, COVID has disrupted education and has highlighted a deep inequality in access to education with this. Do you have estimates on how many children have dropped out of school and in what ways can we incentivize children uh, in order for them to return to school next year? Uh, any plans of doing a follow-up study? Yeah, yeah. Um, unfortunately, as I sort of suggested earlier, the we we would have been able to get a little bit of idea of doing a little bit of simulations. Perhaps if we think we, when you have reduced income, what would be the effect on on uh, on a household? Uh, will will uh, will a non-poor person decide to 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 either shift um, the the schooling from? From private school to public school, or from public school altogether, uh, they drop out. You know, so we 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 could have done that a little bit, but unfortunately, we don't have part of the labor force survey that that's going to be essential for doing a little bit of modeling exercises. If if we this was available, then we could probably do a little bit of extra work, but unfortunately, we don't. Uh, so if, if this is going to be made available to us, so the question, even what by her earlier. The, regarding the all this data, you know, if if all of this data were 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 done much, because I can understand PSA has regular protocols, but in a way, uh, uh, now that it's COVID, then they, you know, we know that we need more data, we need more studies. Uh, I was expecting them to be to exercise uh, a little bit more speed in <laughs> in releasing micro data, but unfortunately, they continue to use the same protocols on release of data. Okay. Thank you for that, Toots. Okay, here's another question for you, and this is from Rosella Agawili. It's about uh, the model of poverty estimation uh, that you use. Uh, he is, she's asking if it allows also for estimating impacts on the basic sectors. If it does, can the analysis be extended to these groups rather than on the income distribution? Uh, the thing is, like, the, the so-called basic sectors, again, if we had that labor force survey data, we could identify the specific people. Uh, in fact, the, the PSA has 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 traditionally been been publishing estimates of poverty on the on some basic sectors, not all. The the problem sometimes is that there might be some uh, some sectors like PWDs. They're very rare. So even if you capture them from a survey, uh, a very rare population, they may you the the, the resulting estimate may not be representative enough. However, when they now multiply their, their sample size by four, uh, maybe it could be better, I don't know. I mean, until we actually have the data, we will, won't be able to, to, to actually play around. So we, we hope that PSA can give as soon as the, the so-called merged LFS FIES data. So that way we could prob probably extend a little bit more the, this, this, uh, this work that we have done. Thank you, Toots. Another question, and this one is from uh, Victoria Rakiza. If there will be an initiative to review and improve the FIES to measure poverty, will you be open to taking into account other measurements, uh, like the multidimensional poverty index, which I understand the PSA has already operationalized for the Philippines? What, also, what about also enriching indicators to measure inequality? Uh, for example, include the use of the Palma ratio. Yeah, well, actually, I regularly produce the Palmer ratio in my my studies, and so with even the multidimensional poverty index, I've uh, I've done my own set of studies. But unfortunately, that that set of studies suggests that the PSA should probably be a little bit more cautious because when they come up with the estimates of multidimensional poverty index, there might be conflicting estimates of of uh, official poverty income data sourced as well as multidimensional poverty, which can stay, say another picture, but then uh, the question the policymakers will, already, will always have is, so what, do, what will we listen to? Is it this MPI or is it the income poverty? So it, will be, it might be a source of confusion, uh, especially if you have potentially differing estimates and they, the data are not linked because right now the, the, the data from MPI is actually coming from the APIS, the Annual Poverty Indicator Survey, Whereas FIES, the income poverty is coming from FIES. If this was all coming from one survey, you could say a little bit more, but then right now uh, you will probably be confusing more people by having all sorts of estimates. And, and this is why I, I'm, while I can understand some people would like to seem 
to to actually get more information on poverty by getting MPI, but I am more on the cautious side. I've seen this work uh, for several years now, and I've 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 even done uh, helping some countries like um, Mongolia and 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 Laos come up with their own estimates, which they want to have it. But still, I would uh, uh, be on the cautious side about this. Okay. Thank you very much, Toots. I am uh, reviewing our um, chat box. Uh, okay, so far there is no, I don't see any new question, but uh, perhaps we can, um, okay, we can talk about the FELSIS since it has just started, the upper registration for the National ID System. And if I may ask Asek Niwane, um, what do you see are the prospects when it comes to the uh, advantages and, and the possible uh, uh, benefits that we can get once uh, the FILSIS, the national ID uh, system, is already in place, ma'am? In terms of targeting, better targeting of our social protection programs? Uh, yes, uh, actually, it will make it easier for the department to be able to identify the target beneficiaries. and. Uh, I think it will be also very beneficial because if once there will be the there everybody will be have a national IDC, ID and entered into the ID system, uh, we could be able to give our assistance directly to them through use of the digital means. Because uh, as of now, the reason why the SAPs in the in this uh, SAP that we are uh, we have just undergone is that uh, some of the delays were because there were no IDs, I mean, there were no identifications that they could uh, really produce. So it was a little bit hard for the uh, financial institutions to be able to come up with their uh, cards. So once the ID system is in place, that would be, it will make assistance and uh, I think other, uh, other, they could access benefits better and faster. Thank you. Okay. Ma'am, um, what is the current system being used by the DSWD when it comes, yeah, the sub-distribution in terms of uh, verifying the, the accuracy of the beneficiaries? Uh, we, are, bang... we are just relying on the uh, SAC forms that uh, have been distributed to the uh, people by the barangay, I mean the barangay officials or the LGUs. Uh, and of course, uh, we have the 2015 list of Hanan, but mm -hmm. that is only for reference. We can we did not really use that to identify the people who should be given SAP. It was the LGUs who look into uh, this because they we believe that they sh should know their own people. And the form that we use is the social amelioration card. Card. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Uh, thoughts? Any thoughts on uh, the on the uh, national ID? Would you have um, any? Um, I have a lot of thoughts about that, <laughs> but okay. uh, but, uh, but, uh, but maybe they, they may not be, <laughs> but they may not be enough for a, a single webinar. Um, but but certainly, I mean, for me, a national ID has always been important. It should have been implemented not just now, but even years ago prior to the pandemic. Unfortunately, there have been some delays in the implementation of this, and that's why, as uh, uh, as uh, uh, Asik Niwani has uh, pointed out, that. Uh, you know, it's not been easy for DSWD and uh, to actually provide uh, the SAP and other kinds of benefits as well. No, uh, I mean we've been so uh, allergic to having IDs. You know, in spite of the fact that uh, you know uh, in in other countries, you know, for instance, if you go to 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 the US, uh, the, there's a social security card. You know, you always have an ID number anywhere, your passport. There there always be a need for it, but unfortunately. We've been resisting a national ID for decades. No? Uh, but the only the next question, however, is it should it be PSA? Unfortunately, it's prone to PSA. And I think right now the PSA has too much already on its plate. And, and probably that's the reason why there was also a little bit of delays uh, in, in trying to figure this out. This wasn't part of their competency. Uh, let me be most, more, more honest about it. But on the other hand, there was there's no agency in the country that has that competency either. I mean, I remember Senator Lackson 
pointing this out in a, during a Senate uh, de deliberation years ago that uh, he doubts whether the PSA can handle it, but unfortunately he can't if, uh, figure out who, who should be implementing it. You know? But the harder part is this, even if there will be a national ID, the question that I pose it into DSWD is this. Suppose they have, yes, the BSWD has its distributions and they will be able to identify from the national ID that, okay, this person is, is correct. It's, uh, this is a, a, a really, uh, because you can always pad, pad your beneficiaries with all sorts of names, right? So the national ID will prevent you from doing that. But the next question that I have is, will, will government, government departments that are giving uh, different kinds of programs, Department of Agriculture, will they be able to share databases with, with DSWD so that you know you don't need to, to waste resources? Because sometimes we, we seem to be uh, giving too much of uh, be benefits to, to people and, and we don't know whether, whether there, there are actual changes in, 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 in people's lives as a result of all the programs, the different programs that we're giving. So the question is that I really have is, will it be important? On one hand, it's important too, because some people are having multiple kinds of uh, deprivations. Uh, suppose you have only one person with just very little deprivation, but then he gets uh, benefits from all government agencies, and that's, uh, that's a waste. Uh, and for me, uh, that, I think that will be something that DSWD, together with other government agencies, have to start thinking about. Mm -hmm. uh, once the infrastructure is there, then there'll be a need for data interoperability to share databases, yeah. uh, but also to ensure also that you you don't you you protect privacy because there are also data. Very, we have very strict data yes. privacy laws uh, mm -hmm. that I think are being misunderstood as well. <laughs> that that people think that you cannot share any data. That's not yes. really true. <laughs> Actually, Asik Niwani uh, underscored that in his in her presentation, the need for um, greater partnership between uh, and among uh, agencies, e even with the local government. And um, yeah, um, Asik Niwani. Yes, yes, ma'am. I would just like to add that, uh, in fact, with our experience with the SAP. The, the reason why we were also delayed was that we had to do the duplication. We have to have data sharing with Dole and DA and, uh, of course, uh, SSS to ensure that uh, beneficiaries have not received double or triple assistance. And, yeah, I agree with uh, Dr. Toots on what he has said, that it's necessary that we have to be able to see to it that we could synchronize data so that services could be identified and people who have received services should also be tempered some way and, uh, and they could trace how far the services have gone. So uh, I believe there, is a, uh, there's, there are talks regarding that and uh, we hope that uh, the, in the near future this will be done so that once the uh, PILSYST have already accomplished its job for the ID system, then the databases will already be shared, uh, yes. probably with uh, some MOA or whatever agreements to ensure that privacy of the persons being served or the people are, of course, uh, not uh, placed in jeopardy. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Asik Niwan, and uh, thank you, too. It's okay. We have another question here. It's from uh, Dr. Justin Sikat, a uh, research fellow at PIDS. Is there a plan to link the FILSIS with the four piece and SOC 10 databases so that the SAP can be distributed directly to the ATM or through the ATM? Oh, okay. Uh, well, probably it should be um, PSA since it's the implement. It is the implementing agencies uh, that should answer this. But uh, any thoughts, thoughts on uh, this question by Justine? Yeah, actually, that's that's the whole idea. I mean, because I think when PSA starts to develop a national ID, they will they and then, for instance, uh, DSWD starts to, to start asking, is this a real person? I mean, based on your ID, you, you DSWD will ask PSA, is this a real person based on the national ID? 
then the PSA will just say yes or no. Yes. So, so in a way, uh, that, that would be very straightforward. And then eventually, if this is all linked again, it's the question of linking databases. That's really what's, that's why I'm really pointing out this interoperability issue because, um, you know, once that's there, then uh, if, if they can then have a, a link even with all the banks, et cetera, then this will be straightforward. But again, the question there is, how do you do that in, while maintaining privacy? Uh, so the issue isn't whether or not anybody should not have access because people misinterpret privacy as that, that it's going to be possible, nobody can access it. No, that's not, not, that's not true. Privacy is not about that. Privacy is about respecting the people but ensuring that nobody will be put in harm's way. So the question in there is just making sure that there will be people who are accountable because, uh, because sometimes some people can misuse the access to data. So it's important that, you know, if you're going to be like a doctor, a doctor has medical records. And if, some, if, if I go to a hospital somewhere and, uh, you know, the doctor should, should be able to have re uh, access to my records in that hospital. And, and, and it's not an issue of privacy. He should be able to get access and he should be accountable. That's the whole point, accountability. And people misunderstand that. Thank you, Toots. Okay. Um, uh, let's entertain a question from our, one of our Facebook viewers. And this one is from Julius Ibai Dumaga, Dumangas. Um, so it's, since this is about the study, uh, I, if I may, uh, address this to you, or perhaps Francis, who is, uh, among our panelists in the open forum. Francis, would you like to take this? Okay. The question is of the seven income contraction scenarios presented. What probably is the closest to reality that government can use in order to properly calibrate policy response? Let's give this to Francis Toots. Hi, Sheila. Thank you for Hi. passing on the question to me. I think Dr. Albert would still be the one who would be best answering this question. But uh, uh, I think Any the, thoughts? the, well, for me, the one that has, uh, the one that should be would be closest would be uh, I, if I remember it correctly, scenario two. Uh, if Dr. Albert can correct me, but uh, the one where we would consider uh, giving a um, SAP to not just the poor but also to the ones who are vulnerable, because that in that way we are also pre um. Because really, that's what uh, the SAP should do. No? It, it should also prevent um, those who are near the poverty line from falling further below the poverty line yeah? or further of uh, the poverty line, in, in, in which case they would become poor. Um, because I, I, I think I, I well, based, just really just based on what I have observed, there are a number of people that we tend to not consider poor. Uh, for instance, um, I wouldn't consider a lot of the, the jeepney drivers that we observe now that are uh, in the streets asking for uh, support to be, to be poor because essentially, well, they have assets. They, if they are able to uh, go outside, they would actually have, um, if they are able to ply the streets, they would actually have some revenue and income. So if, if you can think about it, um, their monthly revenue, monthly income, maybe more than 10,000 pesos, and then they wouldn't really be, um, cannot really be considered poor, but uh, they would are actually be one of the most vulnerable. And we have seen this in, in reality. They are actually very vulnerable because of uh, the, the community quarantine. So I think that is one of the things that we should really be looking at. Uh, we, there are actually groups of people who are not poor, but they're actually very vulnerable because of this situation. And then that would be a, a good scenario to, to base our uh, strategy. So we don't really just focus on the poor, but also on the, those that are very, very vulnerable. Okay. Uh, Sir Toots, would you have anything Toots, to add? would you have anything yeah. to add? Yes, yes. We, when we were when we were devising this whole strategy, we were really trying to use the the Sumner paper, uh, uh, the uh, one of the papers that I cited earlier, uh, that 
that uh, essentially is looked at 5%, 10%, 20% uh, contractions in consumption. But here, since we use income, so we use income. 5% income the, the decrease, 10% income decrease, 20% uh, income decrease. So that's why um, Francis was right that the second scenario of the three scenarios was the one that's that's the middle scenario that seems to be more of uh, within within what we think because partly when you think of even GDP, GDP grow GDP will is is assumed to decelerate between seven to nine percent as per uh, the BSB governor now. Uh, so and per capita that means another one point five percent surge points further. You know so that's about. Uh, eight point five nine nine percent to about eleven point five percent. So that means ten percent income reductions would be fairly fairly a good way of of uh, estimating what the likely impact. Now, so uh, a ten percent income, but because of SAP, even with SAP, <laughs> we still uh, and the SAP was meant to help, as I said, seventy five percent of families. Then you had another uh, set of uh, a million. Um, uh, wage subsidies given to those who were, did not get the SAP but uh, needed some support, you know. So, uh, so we we try to distribute that that uh, back the, the, those kinds of income support to be able to get a, a fair idea of what the actual likely impacts. Okay, thank you very much, uh, uh, Toots. Let's uh, now um, entertain some more questions from our WebEx uh, participants. And this one is from, uh, okay, there is, um, there is a comment here from Bernadette Balamban. Uh, next, FIES. Okay, I think uh, Bernadette is from the PSA. Next, FIES will be conducted in 2021. MPI methodology is still being developed by PSA and the PSA will conduct pilot of CBMS next year. Official poverty statistics will still be generated using the FIES. Uh, I think this answers the question of uh, Director Nivel Bangsal of uh, the CBMS. Thank you, Bernadette. Uh, we appreciate your, your response. Okay, moving on. Um, uh, we have a question here, uh, which is directed to Asak Niwane from Rosella Rose Agkawili. Um, given that 1.5 million more people will live in poverty as a result of COVID, is this reflected in the DSWD 2021 budget? We understand there is no SAP-related budget in 2021. What mechanisms will DSWD or the government use to address these additional people living in poverty? Asik Josie. Yeah, um, that's, uh, yeah. In the 2021 budget, there is no such uh, thing as uh, SAP. However, we have calibrated all our programs to see to it that it is responsive to the uh, pandemic in addressing pandemic. So uh, we have to, we have even our regular programs are now uh, redirected to see to it that it is at, uh, considering the impact of COVID-19 in all their programs. So that's how we will be addressing the uh, uh, the 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 uh, COVID COVID uh, impact in 2021. So uh, that's it. That's how it's going to happen. So we have this uh, AO three. Uh, three. Well, this is the response uh, re recovery plan for uh, the SWD in uh, addressing COVID. Even uh, that is until 2028. So we have a roadmap which is called Sulong, uh, Sulong uh, RRP uh, for mm -hmm. the uh, for the department of for the department to follow. Thank you. Thank you, Asik, uh, Josie, and uh, we have also received another um, comment, another update from uh, Maricel Deloria of the DSWD. The digital payment of four P subsidies is already being done. And we have already started distributing cash cards for SOCPEN beneficiaries. Okay, another question of, uh, from Facebook, from Janelle Rabe. 
How can LGUs monitor groups of people who are vulnerable but not necessarily considered poor? What tools or guidelines are available for this purpose? Um, any thoughts on this? Uh, Toots or Asak Niwane? Well, clearly CBMS is meant to do that. I mean, to get as much information from at the, at the local level, but then all local governments actually should have been collecting data about their people. <laughs> but of unfortunately, course. data collection is it has its cost, and also mm -hmm. the, the their question their questions on capacities also uh, of uh, LGU officials and staff to actually make sense of data and, and things like that. So. In a way, you can understand that uh, uh, this is why perhaps in certain locales, uh, local governments do, do not collect data, but they could get registers. They could have like information on, on people who come in and ask for some kind of help and then put that somewhere. Unfortunately, I, again, the question is capacity. So what do they do with that kind of data? Uh, I remember there was a time in a, in a certain school uh, I was so impressed. People were saying, "Oh, we are actually uh, encoding the data of ev all the students in in, a, in Excel." And uh, and then I said, "Okay, so where was uh, last year's uh, last year's uh, grading sheet?" And they said, "Oh, pinatungan na po namin eh, kasi ano next year na, so <laughs> they don't archive." So ayan. So yun yung appreciation for data uh, that, that I think is an issue of capacities too. So that's why I tell that story yeah. partly because. We have yeah. to understand that, you know, local governments, uh, while they may want to, may, they may not have the financial or, or actual technical capacities to do that. And hopefully with this CBMS law now in place, perhaps that might be an opportunity. Uh, we'll see. Uh, Actually, we had a PIDS study that assesses CBMS. No? Uh, it was uh, authored by Dr. Justin Sikat and... Uh, in our webinar, which uh, took place July 13, Dr. Sikat uh, reported that one of the uh, challenges being faced by the project is that um, very few uh, LGUs uh, devote uh, funds for data collection. However, it is also uh, uh, written in that CBMS law, CBMS law that capacity building will be given to the fourth to fifth class uh, municipalities. And with the additional revenues that are LGUs will receive, remember the uh, mandanas, no? So they will receive additional revenues by 2022. Then they could, uh, th that's an opportunity for them to beef up their um, data collection and so that they will come up with more relevant uh, and evidence-based programs. You were you were telling us just about, um, you know, data, uh, no, LGUs and not even LGUs, other agencies not really into into uh, data collection and processing the data. Um, ED, uh, Deputy Executive Director Elvin, no? and who also used to work at uh, um, the Department of Education, we have something to say about, about this. Elvin? <laughs> well, I, I can't speak for <laughs> that anymore, want, but in terms yeah, of... Yeah, that I want to yeah. run the boat, but you may have something to share as far as PBSP is concerned, you know, in terms of right. your initiatives with regard to uh, um, promoting more evidence-based policies and programs. Right, right, right. Actually, I, I want to weigh in on both the question about local governments and data and also education continuity uh, considering the pandemic. On the, on the local government side, we have, we as PBSP and even other local and international NGOs have, have been working with local governments and that continued with the pandemic. A lot of the initial challenges were, in fact, in this area. How do we collect timely data and how do we sustain that over the course of, say, the next few months as we continue to understand the impact of the pandemic, the recession, and how local governments may best uh, direct their interventions and how us as the as a development sector can also complement these efforts. Um, from our experience, and this is working with both, say, large urban LGUs and third, fourth, fifth class uh, municipalities throughout the country, uh, the, the willingness and interest and enthusiasm are almost always there. It's always a question of internal capacities and resources. A, a model that we have seen to have worked in some 
in some context is really working with community-based organizations and making CBOs part of the whole planning, data collection, uh, policy making, and priority setting uh, process. So these CBOs, even if they, a lot of them might not have the technical savvy for data collection, they do provide the connection and the credibility to work with uh, local communities and households. And I think that that shortens the, the distance between the local chief executives, his or her team, and the, and the, the people who are needing the uh, help the most. So I think the interventions would have to be quite contextualized, but I do agree that there's a lot of uh, need for capacity building, even just uh, giving them some, some idea on the available and free solutions that are out there. So a lot of people, for example, would still uh, use proprietary spreadsheet software, whereas a lot of LGUs do have internet access and can rely on online uh, tools to simplify the work that they do. They can also use uh, social media communications and platforms to collect data, uh, which is also what we did for Zero Extreme Poverty Philippines. So we use uh, Facebook Messenger, which is free even for those without, um, without paid data sub subscription uh, during the onset of the pandemic and the lockdown to collect data from, from beneficiaries of uh, ZEP member organizations and NGOs. Uh, I think these are similar tools that have been used by the SWD DOH in either info dissemination or data collection. Uh, on the education side, if I may, um, I don't also have the data, but listening to the president's address uh, on Monday, uh, Secretary Briones shared that uh, as of at least that time, uh, two days ago or three days ago, enrollment in basic education was 89%. Uh, compared to last year, meaning 24.7 million students uh, for this school year so far uh, during the opening of public uh, the, the school year in public schools on October 5 versus nearly 28 million last year. Um, I think that's a good number, to, to be quite honest, 89%. You still have 11% who you have to encourage. If you look at the data for basic education of the nearly 28 million students last year, about 4 million are in private schools. And a lot of these private schools, you take out the, the large uh, and the, the big schools, you are left with a lot of smaller parochial schools that also serve low-income households. And a lot of these households have opted to either stop studying because they cannot afford private tuition anymore, or they shift to public schools. So I think, the, the numbers from, from the department, uh, it's interesting to continue to, to monitor that on how to incentivize, I would say, parents and households to bring their kids back. Um, I think uh, for, when you look at the landscape of education, you have 38,000 public elementary schools. We have 42,000 barangays nationwide. Um, that's, that's a good, that's a good number, 38,000 tracks closely to 42,000 barangays. And there's a case to be made that uh, from our experience, we know that the younger the students are, normally for kindergarten and elementary students up to grade six, they go to the schools nearest to them. So it's usually a school in their barangay. So for, I, I would argue that for barangays, municipalities with no local or community transmission, you really have to look at ways where we relax the, the stringent policy on not allowing anyone uh, younger than 21 to go out. So you can, you can really have smaller cluster-based instruction to complement the learning continuity packages of the department. I think the teachers have done a laudable job relying on printed material or mobile telephony or internet-based uh, modalities, but uh, for ages five, six, seven, eight, uh, that's really going to be quite difficult. You would need to help the students, you would need to help the parents, who, or the an older individual in the household who will serve as the learning facilitators. I think you can really look at almost a bubble type arrangement on a per barangay or clusters of barangay to deliver instruction to to younger students, most especially. 
Thank you very much, um, Elvin. Those are very uh, good points. I hope um, our policymakers are watching. Okay, so I think we have um, already uh, accommodated all the questions from our WebEx participants and our uh, Facebook viewers. So at this point, may I request our speakers to say a few words to our audience um, to close this open forum? May I start with you, Toots, and then um, Asik Niwane, and finally Elvin? Um, there has always been a lot of, uh, you know, uh, attention for poverty by, by government, but I think one of the things that we need to recognize is that poverty should not just be the concern of government, but by all of us. And poverty tends to be, you know, in a way when you measure it, it's about the past but there are also some people near the poverty line or even you know with incomes twice uh, uh, you know less than twice the poverty line and and those people are really vulnerable and we've seen this happen they can easily fall into poverty uh, especially now that there are also people who are dying from 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 covid there are people who's uh, you know, or who continue to face a uh, crisis, trying to ends meet. Uh, and so the question that we always should be bearing is, what do I do? Uh, it's always so easy for us to stay in the co in our comfort zones, you know, uh, and, you know, recognize that, that and, and do our own little thing only within the, our own our families. But we need to help go, you know, give our assistance beyond beyond the you know beyond the four walls of our of our homes uh reach out more to our communities our neighbors and we'll find that there are lots of people in need and they may not be poor per se but they are in need of something they need uh they, they may be facing anxieties and you know it, it helps i think if we we extend that that spirit of bayanihan to a lot of a lot more people uh, yun lang po. Thank you. Salamat, Toots. Okay, um, Asik, Joyce? Yeah, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to be with uh, this uh, uh, study sharing. And uh, thank you once again to, of course, to PIDS, the organizers of this. Uh, yeah, in connection to this uh, webinar, it's really something that we have to always think, and that's the DSWD is always facing poverty that is i think the reason why this department is uh, uh, really established institutionalized to be able to help address some of uh, the reasons why poverty is present in our society and uh, as uh, dr tooth said it is not one agency one person or oh, but it's everybody's uh, responsibility to see to it that poverty could be uh, lessened, if not eradicated. Uh, I believe poverty will never be eradicated because even in the good book, it says that the poor will always be with us. But it is a, it is with uh, each and everyone's uh, responsibility to see to it that uh, we know how to care, give kindness while we can. And especially for this pandemic, we are all uh, into this uh, limbo where we do not know what may happen to each and everyone. Let us uh, give more kindness, be patient more with our people, with our family members, with our coworkers, and especially to the people that we are supposed to serve. So uh, as I said, we cannot do it alone. The agency cannot do it alone, the, the, even if it is called the Department of Social Welfare and Development, it needs other agencies, NGOs, private sectors, and everybody to be able to work together and fight uh, for this. Uh, and we could be able to overcome the uh, pandemic. And we all know that poverty is there. And as uh, the study shows, we will increase, poverty will increase. But uh, I believe we still have the hope that our people are resilient enough to be able to overcome all these struggles and these challenges. And we will be able to do it if we could do it being one. One nation, one uh, 
one mind and the one spirit, then of course, uh, let us always call upon our Lord so that he will be able to help us all in this. Without him, we cannot do anything. So once again, thank you very much. Pids, thank you very much, Sir Toots, and everybody, of course, Sir Ivan, and all those who are present here. God bless and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you very much to Asset Choice. And uh, of course, last but not least, but not the least, uh, Executive, Direct, uh, Executive Dep Deputy Director Elvin Uy of the PDSP. Elvin? Right. I should have spoken before Asset Josie. Hard to follow that. No, but let me just say that I think the, the twin crisis, the public health and the economic crisis that we've been navigating for the better part of 2020, have exposed a lot of the longstanding issues, problems, dysfunction not just here in the Philippines, but I, I would say globally. And the global challenge, I think, for all of us is we might wipe out the gains of the last three decades. In the last three decades, we've lifted more people out of poverty and distress than at any point in, in world history. That is on the line in the next 12 to 18 months. And any economic textbook would tell you uh, to respond to a recession, you try to, if it's a hole, you try to fill up that hole. Uh, both with government response and maybe private sector action and resources. Um, I think that's the challenge that continues to confront all of us. The hole is quite deep, quite massive. Uh, we haven't seen the bottom, I, I should say. Uh, hopefully, that bottom we will see the bottom in a few months sooner rather than later. But the, our action to respond and to recover will spell the difference between chronic uh, dysfunction and poverty among our most vulnerable or something that mirrors the trajectory that we had prior to these crises. Uh, the actions of government will inform the investments of private sector and how the development sector will also respond. We continue to work in partnership and in collaboration with all our sectors. Um, but I, uh, I, I, I do wish for better days for all of us, and and that wish and hope will be will be uh, will be supported by concrete action. So thank you again uh, to PIBS for this webinar, and thank you for this opportunity to address everyone. Okay, friends, please join me in thanking our speakers for the insights that they have shared in our webinar um, this afternoon. So let's give all of them a big virtual clap. And uh, thanks also to all of you uh, for participating in the discussion. Okay, so at this point, I would like to announce the three winners of our poll uh, for this webinar, and they are John Kenneth Kada, uh, Carisha Cruz, and Shello Luz Mondehar. I repeat, John Kenneth Kada. Karisha Cruz and Shello Luz Mundihar. So congratulations and thank you for uh, joining our poll. So each of you will receive a set of PIDS publications plus um, five guaranteed slots uh, to, to our uh, next two webinars for this month. And our team will get in touch with you for your mailing address. Okay. And just a few reminders before we finally close, uh, you can access all the presentations from today's webinar from our website. Second, uh, may we request you to please answer the feedback survey that will pop on your screen after this webinar. And we will also email you the link after the event. Um, your comments are important to us to improve our, um, our weekly events. Please also uh, visit our website and social media pages uh, regularly. And for our forthcoming events, uh, we have uh, a webinar, another webinar next week on October 15. Okay. There seems to be a problem with our uh, PowerPoint presentation, but uh, well, we have a webinar next week on October 15 and another one on October uh, 22. So I uh, hope we hope you can join us again. And finally, we would like to um, acknowledge the various uh, organizations from the government, academic, civil society, business and international development community who join us today. 
And um, as soon as we have fixed the, um, the we will show you uh, their names. Oh, there you are. The names of the uh, various agencies who have joined us today from government, academia, and civil society, or also the private sector. Uh, thank you very much for um, supporting our event. So, friends, this concludes our webinar for today, and uh, we hope to see you again next Thursday. Always stay safe, stay healthy, and of course, stay informed too. Thank you, and enjoy the rest of your day. Marami salamat po. Bye. Thanks, Alvin and uh, Asik Joyce. Thank you, Dr. Toots, Asik Josie. Alvin, Asik Joyce. Bye. Thank, Thank you. Take care, Asik Joyce. Bye bye, ma'am. Thanks again, also, uh, Francis, and to your co author, Michael and Dajana. <coughs> and salamat po sa inyong lahat. See you po next week. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you.